This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, episode 185. You'll figure out a trading style fairly quickly, and then you have to discipline yourself to stay with it and trust it and, and keep your head in the game and not chase every single squirrel that you see um, trying to post up big numbers. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. I don't need your opinion is one of the biggest compliments he could get. Clay Trader. That's right. The ultimate compliment I can get is basically, uh, Clay, shut your mouth. I don't need your opinion. I don't care what you have to say. It's even sweeter if this is uh, somebody that's invested into my training and educational courses because that tells me that job well done to me. When somebody can say, Clay, I don't need your opinion. I don't want your opinion. That tells me they know kind of like how to fish. They know where to fish. They know how to bait the hook. They know how to cast. They know how to reel it in. They know how to do all that stuff. They no longer need me. Need me. And uh, that's the whole idea. That's the whole you know idea behind the culture that we're trying to create here is one of not relying on somebody but being self-efficient. And our co-host Chez will attest. Now he, I'm sure he would be polite about it. But if I were to you know start to give him my opinion on a ticker symbol, like I said, he's not a jerk in the way. If he'd be like, listen, I don't need your opinion. I don't care what you have to say. He wouldn't say that. He would be polite about it. But Chez, right? I mean, at the end, of, at, at this point in your journey. You've put in the time, you've put in the effort, you've invested in your education. You don't really need exterior opinions about your trade plans. You know how to do that all on your own, right? Exactly. And I think uh, it's such a big contrast going from, you know, my my introduction to trading, you know, uh, the regulated markets was that, oh, you just follow somebody who's really good and, you know, you just pretty much ride their coattails um, to now where it's just... It's such a nice feeling to know that I am completely independent. I just like you said, I appreciate hearing other people's views and things like that, but ultimately I know my process, I trust my process, and I mean, there's no better compliment in my opinion than it kind of understanding exactly what you're going to do no matter what. If our community just completely disappeared, you know, I'd still know how to find options trades that I take. Um but but yeah, I, I'm happy to hear that you think that is the ultimate compliment because honestly, as a teacher, that should ultimately be what you're trying to do is pretty much get people to learn how to do it on their own. So uh, and everybody does it different. That's the whole thing is it's not one size fits all. Exactly. And for those of you that think that it's as easy to pay for alerts and all that, you always got to question, yourself, well, what happens if that person disappears or whatever? Then what are you going to do? I mean, that's just the first flaw of many with that business model. But you got to be able to learn how to fish on your own, you gotta be able to trade. And it's just freeing because we can sit there and say, I don't need anybody other than myself. I mean, think about that in any part of life. I mean, I can put on my pants. How great is that? Because how bad would it have to be if you needed to go pay somebody to put on your pants for you? That would be kind of pathetic. And it's the same in trading. It's, you gotta learn how to put on your pants all by yourself. Now we have an interview today with Super Dave. His name is Dave. He goes by Super Dave in the chat room. A little bit of a interesting situation, and uh, we uh, alluded to this right at the get-go of, of the talk itself. But this isn't actually quite like a legitimate sit-down talk, like uh, all of our other interviews are. And we'll explain more on that. Um, so don't. I mean, we actually go down some unforeseen areas, but it's not quite as um, unscripted as you as these usually are. Uh, and I don't want to go any further because, like I said, we we mention it right out of the gates here. But without further ado, let's sit down. Welcome back, Dave. Uh, he's been on here before, way back when. But uh, great conversation, great rabbit holes. And there, there's certainly definitely stuff that somebody from really any phase of your journey uh, you know, can be able to take. He's going full time, but he's going about that in a very smart way. He's scaling in and you know, he, he's definitely got a plan in place. And that's just one of the many things we talk about. So let's hear about Dave and get an update on his journey. Dave, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, this is, uh, we, we, we talked, what was it, last week, but then there were some things you're like, you know, let's play, let's err on the side of caution. So you, you asked if we could redo this. So here we are um, talking again. So um, we're going to, 
I guess we act's not the right word, but Chez and I, Chez, we're gonna have to put on our kind of surprise faces for some things. Uh, <laughs> so, are you ready to are you ready to get our Hollywood on Chez? I am, but I also want the listeners to understand that the podcast is seriously so fun that Dave wanted to do it twice. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> you guys haven't done one yet, and you're in the community. It's time to step up. You know, yeah, I didn't I'm, even I'm, think about that from an from an angle. Go ahead, Dave. I'm on three now. Come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like Chess said, you just true. did yeah. one. You just did one. Uh, I don't even think seven days. I don't know. I don't remember when that was. But uh, so yeah. So listeners, and, and for full disclosure sake, like Chess and I kind of pride ourselves in at this point in time. This isn't quite real, real, but uh, it will be very real in the sense of um, I don't know where Dave wants to take us this time around, and uh, that's kind of the exciting part here. For a little context, Dave, you were last on episode 55, which this will be episode 185 that airs. So I'm not a mathematical genius, but that's what, 130 episodes ago. So there's what, 52 weeks in a year. So you haven't been on for like essentially two and a half years. So uh, welcome back. Thank you. And um, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm out doing myself. I'm trying to do the mental math and tell you exactly how long it's been, but I'm just not that good at math. But it's it's been right around two years. So, nutshell, your first time on here as best as you can, because yes, it has been a long time. But I guess uh, you know where did you hear about the markets? What got you interested? What happened? And then where did you kind of last leave us off again, to the best of your ability? Sure, I uh, I was looking around for different things and I saw somebody on TV one day and uh, went into a, um, a training program that was ridiculously overpriced um, and didn't teach me anything from a fellow named Tim and from there um, eventually found a clay trader website and I started in on the $99 plan and was trading something and uh, let's see I think it was gold i think it was j-u-n-g and it scared the living daylights out of me and i said something about that and you called me right out and said well you don't have enough training and you don't know what you're doing and you're going to get yourself burned and i said yeah you're right and i closed all my accounts down and joined uh ctu and started learning how to trade and i do i you know i'm looking at your thumbnail right now and i called him out how do you respond and i I do commend you because although I don't remember all the details, sometimes the room will be, I mean, if you show up as a new person and you run your mouth and you run your mouth and you're talking about, hey, you know, risk management and I'm, I'm doing this risk and my, and it's, then nobody will say anything like, hey, that, that sounds good. If you show up as a new person, run your mouth and you kind of come across as well, not knowing what you're gonna do, then, you know, some people are like, you guys are a bunch of jerks. Nobody's a jerk, but I mean, if you want to show up and, you know, act like a gambler, then people will call you out and say, yeah, you're, you're kind of acting as a gambler. So I, I do, and some people, they, they'll uh, show up and then I want to refund. You guys are a bunch of jerks. It's like, what do you, you've been a member for like two minutes. What do you just calm down and maybe, you know, realize the possibility that is there a chance that you actually don't know what you're doing? So, but Dave, I mean, did you give us any pushback or did you kind of take it at face value? I'm, I feel like you uh, were one of the people that took it exactly how it's meant to be taken. It's just tough love and hey, it's nothing personal, but if you want to succeed, you're, you're not on the pathway to success. Do you remember uh, your immediate feelings after being confronted? Oh yeah, I remember it exactly. I, I knew right away that yeah, I was being called out because I really didn't have any idea what I was doing. And I'm an adult enough to go, yeah, they, these people are right and they want you to succeed. I saw I saw Chez, I saw Hooch, I saw you and several other people trading successfully and offering uh, tough love. I, I like that word and said, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm going to close my account down. And it was in an offshore trading company somewhere off the coast of North Carolina. Uh, I closed that hmm. one down completely. <laughs> yeah. And went to work for... Uh, uh, went to work to get myself CTU funded and started working through the courses. Yeah, and, and just like Clay was saying, the thing is that we see people so often kind of go through, um, you know, they've joined, they say something that might show their hand as being kind of more of a new trader. Uh, 
the tough love is because we watch people do silly things all the time and there, there's just no excuse for it really. Um, but yeah, some people take it not correctly and I'm glad you took it for what it was meant to be, which is something helpful. We don't just decide to be great members over stuff like that. We just, we like to treat trading like a business, not gambling. So I'm glad you took it at, you know, exactly how it was intended. But, um, so you're, you're CTU funded and we're just catching the listeners up now. Um, I'm going to assume, I'm pretty sure you had gone through the entire program last we talked and then were you, you were, weren't you trying to focus on a few specific tickers? I was. Um, I was moving around, jumping around a lot, uh, looking at different things, some of the high betas, you know, the FANG stocks. And I settled in on SPY uh, due to the options trading. Um, I prefer to trade options. So SPY works good. It's very, very liquid. And uh, typically speaking, during the uh, the busy time, you'll see 20 to 30 million an hour. So you have lots of chance to get in and out of something like that quickly. Yeah, so this is going to be for some newer listeners out there. Dave's just saying that essentially it has a ton of liquidity versus, you know, um, any of you penny stock traders out there, I'm sorry to say it, your, the liquidity is a lot less. It takes a lot more effort to get in and out at the prices you want. So with SPY, it's a one cent spread. You know, you can pretty much be as big or as small as you want. So um, yeah, I'm glad you decided to use a liquid product because, you know, price and volume, those are two very, very important things in trading. Yeah. So I guess, you know, how did that go? I'm pretty sure that's where we left off last time. So I guess we'll, we'll pick it up from there. Yep. I, um, I have moved ahead and had uh, things going on with uh, my daughter. So I've unfunded my account three times uh, so far and started all over again, each time getting a little better in my trading style so that I could move myself forward a little quicker and uh, very very happy with the uh, with the results and um okay well this is something that, new no no faking here no hollywood acting um since the, just so i understand right since the last time we talked up until this point you've had to defund your account three times just for personal issues yes sir okay oh, well that's there we go new stuff around so uh i don't know Ches. maybe this might be our new policy we have to do everybody twice in this time span of a week just to make sure uh, <laughs> nate would love that having to patch together all that sort of stuff but uh no okay so um so for clarity's sake not because you went off the rail and you know threw all your all account in some big you know out of the you know money option that didn't work out this was just personal reasons why you had to defund exactly no dumpster fire at all oh. okay awesome so i i'm just curious um did did that play any mind games with you at all? Because I I would imagine that if you have some momentum going on and then all of a sudden, oh, I got to defund, um, it, it could be maybe maybe discouraging, maybe. But I mean, did that play any mental mind games with you at all? Oh my oh my gosh, yes. Uh, I I kept struggling at the uh, at at a at a solid number and kept getting up there and I'd eke over it and come back and forth and back and forth. And I talked to Sean a lot about that because when she was doing her thing, um, she struggled with big round numbers as well. They'd, they'd kick you in the teeth and humble you again, just when you were saying, oh, look how good I am at this. And then yeah, reality check. <laughs> right, right. So how did you, I mean, what, how, how did you mentally get over those roadblocks to be, to have to defund the account? And then eventually you obviously, you know, refunded it again. I mean, was there, wh what did you do to kind of, you know, keep your mental momentum, if you will, going in the right direction? When I got up to a big number that I was paying attention to, I would take the amount that I was trading and reduce it down dramatically to a much smaller number. So if my account, just for an example, if my account was at three, I would trade one so that I didn't focus on the three at all. Gotcha. And I think a lot of people struggle with that, including myself. You know, those big round numbers are essentially what we, um, you know, if anybody has any background at all in trading, is a resistance level. I call it an account resistance level. But yeah, it's, um, correct me if I'm wrong, do you realize at a relatively quick pace that there's a lot of psychology involved in trading, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's a, all about controlling your emotions because if you spend even a little bit of time studying the courses and trading and learning about what you're comfortable with, you'll figure out a trading style fairly quickly. 
And then you have to discipline yourself to stay with it and trust it and and keep your head in the game and not chase every single squirrel that you see um, trying to post up big numbers because little numbers add up very, very quickly. They sure do. Base hits uh, get runs all the time. You know, it adds up pretty quickly. But yeah, I think a lot of people have trouble kind of realizing that, uh, you know, once you have your process down, it's tough. Uh, you know, you have, oh, I've had three losers. I guess I'm going to start looking for another strategy or, yeah, it didn't work the first time I tried trading that way. So I'm kind of done doing that. And, you know, people style jump all the time. I'm absolutely guilty of that. Did you ever kind of, did you run into any of that right after you kind of finished going through the courses or did you know what you naturally wanted to gravitate towards in terms of how you want to trade SPY? Uh, I quickly figured out ways to trade SPY. Initially, when I started, if someone goes back and listens to my first podcast, I had way too much information to make a decision to enter a trade. And the longer I've done this, the more comfortable I am with much fewer signals to uh, enter a trade and to exit when I'm right or wrong. Um, initially, there was way too much overloaded information. Gotcha. And, and I think as we generally talk to people who have been trading for longer and longer, um, most people end up pruning things that are on their charts. They go from, you know, having 10 indicators to having two or, you know, one or something like that. So um, i glad to hear that's just, in my opinion, part of putting in your screen time. And obviously you've dedicated many, many hours to trading and you know pretty much the personality of, you know, what you're specifically trying to trade. But in terms of your criteria for trading SPY, what were you looking for? Are you a breakout trader? Are you buy-in supports? What are you doing? I was primarily, I think, a buy-in support and breakout. Um, mostly, a, I would say buy-in support. So what were these criteria, though? So, I mean, back when you said there was way too much, um, and I like the, the word Ches used, pruning. So before you started to prune the strategy tr tree, what did that you know make up? Because I, I have a feeling that there's probably some listeners out there that are probably like, oh, that's kind of like my criteria. No wonder why I'm struggling so much because maybe, just maybe I have way too many things that need to happen or you know dynamics, indicators that need to line up. So I mean, to your best of your ability, again, for listeners, this is like two years ago, but what was that criteria that, that has since you know changed a lot? But way back when, what, was, what did the list look like of what you needed to see? I honestly don't remember all of them anymore. I'd have to go back and listen myself, but I had probably five or six moving averages, uh, MACD, stochastics, uh, volume weighted profiles, support and resistance. You know those charts that you do every now and then in the webs? That's what mine looked like. I was, so you, were, you, it was, were you singing Pink it, it Floyd was, while you did your trades just because you had a, a laser light show going on, it sounds like? Yeah, yeah. I was I was analyzing and paralyzing myself at the same time. That indicator set is called the works, by the way, Clay. That's what we're going to coin it. <laughs> the, the works. works. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And every, the works and everything in between. Um, Three, well, 355 and it comes with a Coke. <laughs> there, there we go. There we go. How long did that last as in terms of the works indicators? So how long was the works in play until... Um, not necessarily you perfected anything, but before you kind of waved the white flag and said, you know, Dave, maybe things are a little too complicated. It was probably about a year I began pruning things out. I was um, talking to another uh, CTU guy out in Michigan, and uh, we became friends and we talked back and forth. And he ran very, very neat charts. And he kept calling me out saying, why do you have all this stuff? You know, you, you, you can't make a decision. You're waiting for 22 things to line up. So I didn't, wasn't really waiting for 22 things to line up, but point was made that I just had way too much information in front of me to make a trade. Yeah. And it took somebody from the community to kind of call you out in almost a, a joking, but serious way of mm -hmm. that you were basically just, you know, a, a paralysis by analysis. And what would you remember? What were some of the th first things you started to prune out? I pruned out um, my moving averages and the, um, the um, studies, all the extra studies, volume weighted profile and, and that kind of stuff. And I'm eventually down to the chart that I'm looking at now. I've got a Bollinger Band our golden moving average and eight moving average 
and I've also uh, got a 50 and a 100, which sometimes I look at and sometimes I don't, just so that I can see the overall trend of the the ticker that day. Okay, and I'm curious, and I think this would help out people that are maybe in your former shoes saying, yeah, maybe I have, I have too much going on for my strategy on my chart. But as you made, as you pruned, so as things became less and less, did you paper trade to see, um, okay, yeah, that's a good prune, or e, I should probably put that back, but how did you determine what actually made sense to prune? I mean, was there some sort of testing way that you went about it? Or I guess walk us through that, because I guess how did you adjust the strategy and made so, and make sure that your adjustments did actually, you know, were logical and made sense within the, the grand scheme of the strategy itself? Sure, anytime I was cutting something out or adding something in, I paper traded it for a day or two to see if it uh, supported my theory or it worked against me. And over the a period of time, I eventually get down to the, the set that I'm working with now. But I did paper trade rather than live trade it. Um, that seems a little bit like gambling to jump behind the wheel of a car without knowing uh, what you're doing with it. Yeah, hopping hop behind the wheel of a car and you're like, oh, I don't know where the brake is, but this will be fun. <laughs> Let's go as fast as we can with no brakes. So yeah, that's the equivalent of pretty much hopping into a live account without being prepared for it. So um, now correct me if I'm wrong, your paper trading, so we have people who are always seem to have a mixed feeling on paper trading. I personally enjoyed it. However, when the rubber meets the road, I was kind of lacking in the psychology department. Um, it sounds like for your case, your paper trading led to the confidence that you have to kind of go live. You understand that prior to putting money on the line, your strategy works, you're happy with the performance, and you recognize that you're not gonna win every time. Is that right? That's correct, yep. And and right away, I didn't win. Um, when I went two years ago, went from getting rid of my uh, offshore account to opening up a uh, account here, I don't care how you prepare with paper. The first time you go out live, uh, it, it's going to rattle you a little bit. And I figured that out right away. So I reduced my size dramatically down to like one or two contracts to start with. Um, when I went live to build my confidence up and then added in um, just a single contract at a time, like two days later, instead of trading two, I might be trading three. But I didn't go from two to 20. <laughs> right, right. And uh, I think that's very important for people to understand is that, like I said, you can paper trade until, you know, cows are flying over the moon. However, what, what's going to happen is that once that money's on the line, those voices that uh, haven't been really making appearances at this point, no matter how realistic you keep it, they're going to start kind of rearing their ugly heads. So I'm glad to see that you recognize that you need to reduce your size and, you know, really kind of ease into it because we have some people who brand new to trading. I got a six figure account and I'm going to trade, you know, $25,000 lots. And I'm like, man, you, <laughs> you might want to think twice about this. Let's start with, you know, a, a hundred shares or two. Um, before you kind of get rolling. So I guess how long did it really take you to, to kind of get your, I'm going to call it normal size. How long did the, the break-in period go after you went live? I'd have to say from the from the live way back on my first podcast till now, pretty much to the beginning of this year before I'm comfortable trading um, bigger size. And I don't always have them on, but sometimes the uh, uh, contract size is, pretty large and it's taken you i mean just for reference we're recording this uh, basically uh september so it's um you're, you're about nine months into into your kind of comfort period of, of establishing where that was but up until you know the the, the beginning of the year you, you i mean you earlier said you didn't have any like dumpster fires or anything like that so was it just kind of a lot of uh back and forth was it small account growth was it just uh very minimal account loss but I guess, what did it actually look like during the figuring it out period from an account perspective? I mean, because it, it, clearly you know how to manage risk. Clearly you're halfway decent at managing risk because people that are bad at that eventually would have stories of, oh yeah, and I blew up my account and I had to start again. But that never occurred to you. So I mean, what did your account look like during the whole figuring out period that you just figured out, you know, like I said, about nine months ago as of, of, of this recording? Well, I did some math. 
out and uh, extended it out over a, a daily uh, to a yearly figure and figured out that between 3 and 5% growth per day adds up pretty huge. And then I backed that up and said, okay, so what's what's 5% of the amount that I'm trading today? That's, well, I don't know, the figure, $50. Okay, so $50 is my target. How many contracts can I buy and how far do they have to go to get that $50 based on the options that I trade and the delta that it'll feed me? And when it got above that figure, the, the $50 figure, then I started protecting that 4 to 5%. And I wouldn't let it back up. And I wouldn't, I'd have one runner on and, and that's it. And then the rest of the stuff is protected. And uh, initially it was very small growth, but like I said before, little numbers add up very quickly. So during this phase when you're just figuring out your comfort from a, a position sizing, your, your account was actually still, gr sure it was slow growth, but your account was still growing during this, during the figuring out period? Yes, absolutely. That's, uh, Jez, that's a good problem to have when people are trying to figure stuff out, but uh, figuring out and account growth. Uh, the power the power of a strategy absolutely. and a plan, and that's why you, you gotta start with the strategy. And then part of a strategy is, because this is nothing new, and Chez and I, we've talked about this time and time again, but you could have a strategy that works. Like statistically, it works. There's no doubt about it. But that can still not work. You may say, Clay, what are you talking about? That's a total contradiction because you just told me it works. Yes, but if you do too big of position sizing, that's gonna throw off your mental makeup. You're gonna freak out mentally. So a strategy that actually does work no longer works because you're not managing the actual position sizing of it. And until you realize that as a trader, you're, you're never, it's just, it's not gonna work because again, you could have something that works that all of a sudden doesn't work. And I, I love how Dave just didn't, yeah, it took me, you know, several months, like literally months upon months, over a year to figure out the whole position sizing dynamic. And that does take time. I'm sorry that we can't sit here and tell you that to buy your program and you'll know exactly how much position size works, but that's a bold faced lie because each and every different person is different. I think it's been a while since I've used this, but personal risk tolerance is like, Clay, teach me how to have fun. Okay, curl up by the fire and read a book. Some people be like, okay, that, that would be great. Other people are like, what? But I could tell you, go jump, you know, go skydiving. Okay, Clay, that sounds great. But somebody else, uh, no, that doesn't sound like fun to me. Why, why, and what's the difference between those two people? Personal risk tolerance, and the same is true for trading. So I don't know how I got off on this. Oh, yeah, I do. It took Dave a long time to figure out that position sizing, but sure, it took him time to figure it out. Sure, it took him time to fine tune, but because he has a strategy that does actually work because he's you know put in a lot of time and effort to learning, there can still be account growth. So don't take, oh, you gotta figure something out out. Wait, what? Figure something out as, there we go. Oh, great, I, everything's still broken or ruined. No, that's not, that's not what Dave's, nothing was broken or ruined. It just needed fine tuning. And uh, a lot of times the fine tuning can slow down growth, but um, you know it can still result. I don't even know if I'm making sense, but I know the point I'm trying to make at least is super important because I see it all the time and it's um, a massive problem. Ches, did any of that make sense to you? Yeah, it did, but it's just the whole the whole thing is kind of, you know, you need to understand your bankroll and how to kind of grow it logically. You can't be going for, oh yeah, I just started trading and I'm going to, you know, triple my account in the next three months. Those are unrealistic and it's going to lead you to do silly things, which is why, like I said, I've the psychology part of trading, in my opinion, is still one of the hardest things to kind of figure out because no one can really... No one can do it for you. Everyone reacts differently when they have their hard-earned dollars on the line. So Dave's always kind of kept it simple. He never said he's gone all in on one trade. You know, I need to make that money this time, this trade only. So yeah, he's just treating it like a business. And those yeah, are the and the other who that's a great segue. And people are going to think this was planned, but it's not. So you're treating it as a business. And I, I know, I guess, walk us through your work situation because we we did talk about this, and we both commented how I uh, we believe you're doing this very wisely, uh, but. You know, I'll, I'll let it, you pick it up from here, but work-wise, because you do have a job, but things that have been changing. So walk us through, you know, kind of how you've approached this and then, uh, you know, where you kind of want this all to go from, you know, your your uh, ticker symbol, J-O-B. Sure. I have, excuse me, I've been with the same company for 16 years, an auto parts company. Um, and 
two years ago, knew I was going to be making a transition up here to Pennsylvania. I came from North Carolina, um, which was a uh, a really good move for us. We're originally from up in uh, mountains up near Canada. So moving to the mountains of Pennsylvania fit well and still came up here as a full-time employee and got my account to a certain size so that I could project out the year and say, okay, I have enough money to cover me to the end of the year. If I don't make another dollar at my job, so now I'm going to cut back to just part-time. And I had targeted my birthday, uh, May 21st for that, and that didn't happen. And then looked for my anniversary in June 24th and didn't hit it there either. So uh, a little bit further down the road, got to the number that I wanted and uh, scaled back to part-time hours with them. But that took so a two-year period to put in place. And that that's awesome. And again, since psychology keeps coming up, you uh, at least two that you said you hit two dates and you you weren't quite where you wanted to be. So mentally, how did you overcome that hurdle? I mean, did you did you have to trick yourself with some mind games or because I could I could see that being kind of discouraging. I can see the temptation of just screw it. I'm still doing it. I'm going against the plan. But how did you keep a, a positive attitude, but also a logical attitude that said? no, I, I can't deviate from the plan and just say, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to do it even though I didn't get to where I want from a numbers perspective. So, I mean, did you, you know, what was going on upstairs to be able to, to keep on the track, even though you had a, a couple of missed uh, milestones? Well, I'm financially a pretty conservative person to start with, which is kind of odd because uh, my side hobbies are sometimes uh, rather insane and certainly on the riskier side, a couple of them. Um, downhill mountain bike racing, for example, which I don't do much anymore. But from a uh, from a financial standpoint, I'm 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 very founded and uh, conservative on it. I don't take a lot of risk um, with my money. Uh, I don't run out and buy brand new cars because they depreciate. I don't buy five dollar cups of coffee. Um, no, I just don't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> Uh, it's not what I'm doing. I'm uh, uh, while well, I'm 60 now, and I was looking back then and saying, "Okay, I got retirement coming to me. Now is not the time to take on risk. Now is the time to take on growth." And I, I just like that. You know, you had kind of understood your game plan going into it, and even after missing, say, those two dates that you were ideally targeting, you still stuck the plan because, like you said. Now is not a time to be doing something foolish. You need to take what you got. You have plenty of capital to kind of work with and utilize it to the best of your ability because honestly, you can like like you're doing currently, you know, you're transitioning to a part-time job and trading is going to start picking up the slack. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. The ultimate goal is to trade full-time, yes. right? Currently, I'll tell you that the target is the end of the year. The rollover into the new year will uh, will be my target. If it doesn't happen, that's fine. I'm I've got until I turn 62 to collect Social Security, so I got time. <laughs> and that's that's the whole thing right there is even if he doesn't hit his target, say, for the end of the year, Dave is completely fine to be flexible and stick to the original plan because he has confidence in the plan. He knows what his overall goal is. He's not going to try to squeeze water out of a rock or something here and do something silly. He's going to stick to the plan. And I think a lot of that, that's just kind of discipline. And, um, you know, Clay and I have run into some other people who, who do some, some more, let's say, we'll call them extreme sports. And they generally tend to, and Clay, correct if I'm wrong, they tend to fall on the riskier side. Um, that kind of adrenaline rush they get from skydiving almost comes out in their trading sometimes to their detriment. And uh, yeah, Dave he, almost seems to be the opposite. Call him, of that. Uh, an enigma in that sense where his, there's a, d d yeah, you know, good every work, once in work. a while I'll, I'll pull out my uh, the, the source, if I could even say that word right. But I don't think, I just, he's just flipping through I, the know, pages to pick one to throw to in here. Yeah. You're much more. Uh, uh, pithy than I really am. I don't know. I don't know if that actually. I don't even know if that I use oh, that geez. right. But uh, um, no, <laughs> hard, I, I hard agree. To work they, pithy into a sentence. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, and I don't even know if that was right. But it, it sounds. I guess you got to just fake it till you make it. But uh, and make it sound like it was the right word. But I agree. I and before I forget, um, 
what what are these targets again? You had mentioned, but I guess how do you know when you hit uh, your target? You mean you need to see a certain uh, a number in your account? Yes, I'm going to be looking not only for a number in my account, but okay. a um, an average return over the course of a month. And I need to hit that average return. And I'm not thinking on a daily basis because you put too much pressure on yourself. So you got to look at it over a month and say, if, if I grow my account this much, I'm on target. Okay. And then these uh, growth amounts, these just um, you know, numbers, they're all based on living expenses that I, is that where all these, I guess what I'm trying to, you have a plan and it's very, mm -hmm. um, it's very, when you don't have a plan or when you have estimations, then that's where people kind of get into the gray area of, okay, well, I think I hit my milestone or, oh, I think it was close and, uh, but, and then all of a sudden they get them troubles. But it sounds like you have exact numbers that you can look at and it becomes very black and white, which I think is you know very smart because um, you know it, it's going to be much more blatant of you just breaking rules or doing something going off uh, off the, the the planned path. So I mean, these numbers they're all coming from living expenses, or are they coming from other? I guess where did all these numbers come from? That's letting you have such black and white rules of when you can you know officially quit your job and all that. Well, I have all my living expenses pretty well charted out. I know how much I spend for coffee a month. I know how much I spend for gas. Um, I have all those things in a, uh, in a spreadsheet. So I have a pretty good idea what I spend on a, on a month to month basis and what my needs are. And moving from a big house in North Carolina to uh, a cabin in the woods, I live in 680 square feet now. My living expenses have dropped remarkably. Um, moving here, even though I moved into a much colder climate and so I have to heat, um, it's still such a smaller living space and this works very, very nice for me. I like living in a cabin <laughs> in, in this kind of uh, environment. It works well for my wife and I. So it sounds like you have your living expenses calculated and because you know that, you know how to then calculate how much, um, I mean, you want to get your account to a certain um, number that covers, you know, six months, eight months. I mean, what? How many? How many months of expenses do you want to have covered for your account? I'm out ahead um, six to eight months right now. Okay, and, and and my target is to walk away. I want to be at least a year ahead. Okay, gotcha. So your account needs to. Now you're talking to your trading account or a, a, some sort of like safety safety net, um, a, a bank account. All my all my safety nets okay um, are are eight, uh, I was going to say about uh, 8 months okay um, so, i haven't calculated it lately but i'm between 6 and 8 months and i'm closer to 8 i'm sure of it okay so this this so i could walk away right now you right right but so this, none of this is your trading account though right that's like i need your your safety net is not your trading account that's not what you're basing the numbers off of these are external like savings accounts Correct. And okay. my trading account, I I will peel, I'm still doing it, I'll peel money out and put it in my, my safety account. There we go. Okay. And w once it reaches that point, then I will stop peeling out of my trading account and I will just, I'll trade my trading account the way it is. Okay. And that's, I, I want I want to make sure, I mean, I'm, I was pretty sure, but for listeners out there, if you know, from a plan perspective, your, your trading account shouldn't be your living expenses and say, well, even if I don't make any money, my trading account can still pay this amount of expenses. Well, what that your plan is missing there is, sure, you may not make any money, but if it's the trading account, you could be losing money in that account and all of a sudden you're going backwards. But that's why I wanna make sure and clarify for you as a listener that, you know, Dave is talking about external accounts where, yeah, when, you're, when the money is sitting in a savings account, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to just go down in value like a potential trading account numbers could be. So just make sure you you separate all those numbers out if you're trying to put together a plan, uh, because basing living expenses and having those living expenses covered, you know, for you know six months out or a year out on a trading account balance amount that is super risky because that's a, a a volatile account that could definitely you know change in value. So, um, but yeah, Dave, it sounds like you got everything firing on all cylinders now. Um, 
I'm trying to I'm trying to think back to our last talk, but we Ches and I have actually recorded several others, so this is kind of good because it's actually keeping it pretty genuine. But are you still mainly focused on spy as you trade right now? I, I feel like you um you you you'll hop around and trade other things outside of spy. Am, am I remembering right, or am I totally mixing something up with somebody else? Nope, you're absolutely right. Spy is still my uh, foundation ticker. I I watch that. It's on my main screen all the time. Um, but I have eight, 14 charts across three screens that I can bring up that I'm looking for. I'm watching on five-minute charts looking for setups in there, things like Twitter and NVIDIA. And I'm, uh, I, I got some AMD and various other things uh, today that I... I ran and I've got runners sitting on those, but I watch a lot more now. That was a difficult thing for me to step away from spy because it's got 50 to a dollar, you know, option prices. And then all of a sudden you're looking at something like a Netflix, which is much larger. Well, it was much larger for me. It's not like Yonsky who plays Amazon, but it was much larger. <laughs> right. My So my next question is, how do you now do these? You said you have 13 other charts or whatever. Are these charts always the mm -hmm. same ticker symbols? Like, so it's just a big basket of stocks or are those, you know, potential 13 charts changing day by day? Uh, the, there's a foundation of eight of them that do not change. Okay, so my, here's my the question. Others, how, how did those eight become the eight? Uh, they're based upon the size of the underlying and the options um availability and size of the options uh, i'm not interested in trading an amazon option which is uh, a 25 five dollar option i like to stick in a um, under three dollars and fifty cents for a single option and correct me if i'm wrong you do that as a function because you can essentially you under you know how to manage your risk on an option that price correct. that yeah. way correctly yep gotcha perfect and um i would assume that the eight options you do focus on we call them i personally call it my options basket um people got their own names for it too but they they have pretty much ranges that are tradable it's not like uh you know a ford or something like that so it, it has enough movement where you can generate a return is that and that's why they kind of made yes, the cut for those eight yeah they they have a nice predictable type of movement um and aren't range bound, but are range predictable. Gotcha. And um, yep, volatility, it cuts both ways. But if you are a trader and understand risk management, um, volatility can be your kind of best friend. I, uh, I, uh, and I was actually surprised that these developed. Clay, why don't you ask that question? I, oh, I was going to say, I was surprised that these developed because I, two years ago, would have never thought that I would be looking at some of these tickers and someone would suggest, hey, what about this ticker? I go, no, no, I am not interested in going anywhere near anything that's involved with Tesla. Forget it. Uh, it's just too crazy for me. But over time, things change and you become more comfortable when you look at it over and over and go, oh, yeah, this is kind of predictable. And it is, it's predictable. It's not the type of predictable that you as a listener are thinking if you're brand new but it's a predictable in the sense of you just have to watch and you have to watch and you have to get to know we've, uh, you know, we said, you know, you gotta get romantic with some of these things because stocks do have a personality um, and they do become predictable, but not like in the sense of, you know, maybe the traditional sense of, it, it's one of those things where you just gotta get out there and, you know, kind of form some gut instincts and you can only do that by observation. And I wanna apologize to Ches. Um, he stumbled over his words and paused. That's because we talked behind the scenes on Slack and I threw him a question that probably wasn't quite worded. In my mind, it made perfect sense, but not in his mind. So, um, Chaz, I apologize. Stop using that yeah. the thesaurus so much, okay? You're I throwing me off with all these huge words that you say to me. Less. But, uh, so my, my question that I, I totally didn't word right to, to Chess, so I'm gonna try to do better with you, is you have those 13 charts and you very nicely explained how those eight core ones get there. But, uh, you know, let's see. 13 minus eight, carry the one. You still have five, you know, tickers left. So where do those remaining tickers come from? How do they, you know, make their way out of the real estate of your screens? 
I uh, listen to the talking heads a little bit. Um, I scan Twitter for news uh, to see who's talking about what. But I am still going to come back to uh, a name that I recognize. Uh, it has to be something I, I know. I'm not going to be trading every single thing that everybody is chasing. I'm much more interested in names that have news that are moving, um, that have uh, increased volume. There's a, a ticker that I'm in today that's uh, well over two times its average volume. And um, it made big news on Sunday and uh, gapped up. It was listed in your uh, room this morning. You spoke about it as one of the uh, gap ups. Which one are you, talking, are you talking about? AMD. AMD. Yeah, I've, oh, okay. I've still got some on of that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. So um, I appreciate you talking ambiguous. But by the time this airs, if people are going to go trade AMD based on what you say right now, uh, yeah, you're working on not 15 minute delayed information, but good like five week delayed information. But so, all right, so AMD yeah. for listeners is not one of the original eight. Is is that correct? Correct. Okay, yep, so it made the list. Uh, it made the list Sunday. based off of on, on Sunday because of, of of news. Was that the primary thing that it, it made the the list of? Um, yes, it made news right away and gapped up. Um, did a little bit of research on it. Found out what the average volume was. Uh, looked at the options availability and uh, uh, how quickly they turn over, and it made the uh, it made the six panel short list. Okay, and this was all just now. When you say you did some research on it, is this uh, research as in multiple time frame analysis from a charting perspective, or is this research from a fundamental standpoint where you're you know digging through cash flow statements and ten Qs and all that sort of stuff? What type? I guess. Define research a little bit more uh, finely tuned. Yeah, that that would make sense that I flesh that out. Um, I go right back to a 30-minute chart right away, and I start uh, laying out support and resistance lines. And I'm going to be looking for trends, and I look at the Bollinger Band. Have you taken the middle Bollinger Band, or are you still below it? Um, where are my two moving averages in relation to the Bollinger Band? So are they offering support or are they offering resistance? And uh, I draw my lines and I set alerts for what I want. And um, when I got up about six o'clock to do this, to go through things, and I do that most days, if I'm gonna trade, I'm gonna be up around six o'clock and start looking through every single thing on my basket. Um, and then I'm gonna find out what everybody else is uh, talking about and then go draw support and resistance on them and see if they make the short list. And I've got a spiral bound notebook here and I've got one page worth of notes. And I would also like to point out one other thing. The last thing on my notes page lists the four trades I take in order, uh, my trade plans, so that the last thing I do is remind myself I trade these four setups, period and I don't trade anything else outside this. I don't chase, I don't force a trade. It has to fit in this plan for me to work. I like that a lot. And just for clarity's sake, you say you watch the talking heads and uh, you kind of scroll around, it sounds like the internet, but you are just doing that to see what people are talking about. It's not like you're listening to the talking heads and just having them puppet you and you're, you know, it's not like, okay, I'm watching the talking heads because I need them to tell me where to buy, where I should sell, where I should put my stop loss. That's not what you're doing. You're just looking to see what people are talking about and then you you take it from there, right? Exactly. The more mentions a particular ticker gets, the more activity it gets from people who are chasing. And the people who are chasing are, um, I don't want to say the people that we, take advantage of. We don't, but the, the people who are chasing are the people that you buy and sell to. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. Now this will make sense for listeners. So when you think think back to uh, uh, a Froggy, the last two part one entitled The Punisher, um, Dave's being a little polite. Uh, Mike was a little bit more brutal. Uh, we are punishing people. You know, Mike talked about punishing those that don't understand math. Um, Dave, I'll, I'll, he's such a nice guy, but what Dave's really saying is, he is punishing people that just show up and are here to gamble, are here to just make it up as they go, are here that don't really understand things. And uh, Dave's strategy is predicated on punishing those that uh, choose to be punished. And there's, um, 
it, it is what it is. And uh, so it, it, I, I would. It is. It is. That's, that's how money yep. flows from one person so, to another. I'm going exactly to call reason. out the word. I'm going to call out the word punished. All I'm trying to do is find where people are dropping money on the sidewalk and I'm more than happy to pick it up for them. <laughs> there you go. That's, uh, um, I mean, I would argue that you're also kind of nudging their pocket and having the money fall out in the first place. And then nudging their pocket is just because you've actually invested into your education. You've learned, you've built a strategy, yes. you fine tuned it. And when you have that, it's amazing. Somebody how, has to lose. Yeah. Somebody's got to lose. And, um, and I don't feel bad about it. I hope nobody feels bad about it uh, because all three of us right now are taking time out of our day to say, hey, this is uh, this is the reality of the matter. And the reality of the matter is I have a strategy that works. And it, it works because there's idiots out there that don't want to put in the time to get it to work. So I am just going to punish them by taking their money. And um, if that sounds a little too brutal, then I, I don't know what to tell you. But that's, that's kind of how the markets work is uh, it's people with the strategy, harvesting people that either actually think they have a strategy or else they're just tear to gamble. Yeah, acting emotionally, irrationally, exactly. Acting That's emotionally much how and irrational. Up. But Chez, um, I know you have a question for him. That was, this was a much better handoff. So this we're, we're, we're getting back in our groove yeah. again. I'm feeling good. Good, good. So, uh, so Dave, I'm very, very impressed. Obviously, you have these certain setups that you you only pretty much trade. That's what you've allowed yourself to do. You know, it works for you, and you're comfortable with it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Do any of those four um, do they work for pretty much any say tradable ticker that you're watching, or to say two of those setups strictly focus on spy, and then you have two more. You know, t your other two strategies might be for say. Like today, you you're you were watching AMD because it was kind of moving a lot pre market stuff like that. Are there any specific ones that you only use for spy and then you trade yes, other have, tickers uh, differently? I have a trade that I use first thing in the morning on spy that I uh, call my tick trade. It's a, a significantly overextended uh, open move, and um, I try to take advantage of that it's a totally a scalp trade. I don't negotiate with this at all. I don't I don't hold. I don't buy 10 of them and hold five. Now, this is, uh, you buy however many contracts you've got, and as soon as it begins to move above um, $5 a contract or five cents in the case of SPY, then I start putting a trailing stop in that immediately. It's totally a scalp trade. Um, and then I have overextended setups I like on SPY for a longer time period which I'll put on a three to uh, 15 minute time frame, And my base on my basket here is on a five minute setup that I'm uh, scouting and I've got a timer on my computer. Every five minutes it comes up and it puts an alert and I go look at all my tickers all over again. Gotcha, because I was just about to say, I'm like, I, I knew prior that you had a tick trade and I just wanted to make sure listeners know that um, that that only works for a certain name, you know, that specifically the tick is pretty much an indicator of. So that's why I kind of wanted to clarify for listeners there. But obviously, you know, to me, it sounds like you're on target here. You're on track. Sure, the timing isn't exactly how you wanted it. But I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Being as conservative as you are with your money and kind of looking at it as the long game, you've not once deviated from the plan, have you? And I, and when I say deviated from the plan, I mean, you've never actually, have you allowed yourself to kind of take position sizes that are either out of your plan or losses that are bigger than you planned? Or have you just kind of, you are disciplined because you are going for um, the long game? Yes, I'm disciplined, but uh, stuff gets in your head. And I've, I've had some pretty interesting losses, pretty large ones that were uh, pretty hard to swallow. Uh, wondering why on earth are you still in here? Why are you letting this go further and further? You know, I wasn't looking for a point where I could add in and, and, you know, pull a horseshoe trade, nothing like that. It was just, it, it, it went down without a parachute and it went down in flames until it reached the bottom and you went, well, there you go. Set that pile on fire. <laughs> now, I've, I have a question. You made the comment about this tick trade. It's very disciplined. There, you don't, there's no negotiating it. It's it just, it is what it is. 
Have any of those large losses come from that particular strategy with a tick trade? No. Okay. No, the tick trade it is not. Okay. No, this was a this was a this five is good. minute no, setup. Roll with me here, Dave. Roll with me. I, we just I, I promise there's a method okay. to my madness. So let's uh -huh. talk about the word negotiate because on that strategy you said you, uh -huh. there is no negotiating, which would tell me that on other strategies that implies that there is some negotiating, which now has me a little wondering. I would bet that those big losses came on some of these strategies where I, I guess negotiating is apparently allowed. So what what do you mean by negotiate? Good question. Um, on the on the tick trade, I don't negotiate because it is totally a grab as much money as you can get out of it in as short a period of time and do not let it back up. Um, there's no support and resistance on it. It is totally a momentum trade. The ones that have burned me are the ones where I put a support and resistance in, and it broke through my exit and looked at it and went, well, I guess I'll give it a little further because it's near VWAP. We'll see if the VWAP will hold it. And then it goes below VWAP and you go, well, grandma's right below it. You know, we've got that solid number. We got $50 right there. Maybe 50 will hold it. And then, then maybe 49 50 and then maybe $49 will hold it. And then all of a sudden you're sitting there going, why, why didn't I just get out when I was $50 underwater on this? Right. Just okay. Go, so it's not set up. And, but that's not part of the strategy is you're not allowed to negotiate support no. levels. I mean, it, it should have been out you, you know, like I said, you should have been out at that first support level that you you uh, dictated. So, all right, I just want to make sure that there wasn't some sort of glaring issue. Wait, wait a second, Dave. Were you telling me that you're allowed no. to negotiate? But I, I see what you mean now, and I just wanted to make sure we had clarity sake on that. So, yeah, that's just a typical, um, you know, Ches and I. Dave, Undisciplined we, trade. Yeah, we all love our charts, but uh, and we've talked about this before, but that's one of the catch-22s of charts is they kind of make the mind games easier in some senses because, like Dave just described, Okay, it broke through that level of support. Uh, oh, but there's that right there. Okay, that'll be my new stop. Oh crap! Um, hey, look, there's that there. Though. Okay, so that technically, and all these things technically do make sense. They are levels of support, but all they're doing is your minds, you know, the evil voice in your head, are using them to justify you staying in a trade that you should have been out a long time ago. So that's definitely a catch twenty two of trade or of charts, as great as they can be. You know, that's one of the pitfalls. But that's why you got to acknowledge the pitfalls so you know, you know, how to deal with them. But um, yeah, I would say that's uh Well, for me. What's that? From I was going to say for me it wasn't a, a I don't feel it was a chart failure, it was a mental failure. I But the the, the chart is making your mental failure easier resistance. to to do is is my yes. point, right? Cuz you're you're mentally saying, "Oh yeah, I'm looking at the chart." I mean, a chart is a chart. It's just giving you data, but the data it gives you can all of a sudden make it easier to um, you know, to, to break those rules. And I've been there, I think all traders have been there that use charts or they, they justify tr trade plan rules based on other data on the chart, but that other data on the chart never had anything to do with the original trade plan. But that, that's that, that's just the, the mind game of, uh, of voices. But um, yeah, that, that's some good stuff. And I'm trying to think, but uh, not that your other interview was bad. I don't want it to come across like that at all, Dave, but I feel like this was, I, we had some really solid talking points, really solid rabbit holes that we went down. Uh, was there anything else? Because looking at the time, we're basically at an hour. Uh, did you want to throw in anything? Um, I mean, we're going to have you back again. It's not going to be two and a half years or whatever. Um, so it's not the end of the world if you don't, for if you can't. But was there anything else you wanted to quick throw out there or cover or, or share with listeners as part of your experience that could, you, you know, you think that uh, it could help them out? Well, just that uh, finding a good, helpful uh, community is is really cool, and I've I've been to um, at least one of the meetups. Pittsburgh, uh, a couple of the others I weren't able to make. Yeah, I got I got to Pittsburgh, and to sit down and talk to like minded people and find out that they're all all just regular people. Um, no matter what the size of their accounts that they're trading are, you have no idea what that is. You're just talking to regular people and. And, and I really found it to be a, a, a great group of people and I, I love being part of the community. That, that's a good point and he was not paid to plug this and whether you join the inner circle, our, our community or some other community, if you feel more comfortable with that. I mean, I, I think that's a great point because um, yeah, trading can be lonely, uh, 
but when you get out there and kind of surround yourself with other people that are in the kind of cut from the same cloth as you that want to treat it the right way, um, then yeah, I, I think that that can only improve yourself as a trader just to, to get yourself around other people that are, are reflecting the attitudes that you have, you know, towards, you know, whatever the goals may be. So uh, yeah, that, that's good stuff there. And uh, well, that's all I have, Dave. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for hanging out. And I kind of assume that you would come back, but will you come back another time? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it, it can't be yep, two and a half years. Back. I mean, it's, it's got to be a little bit sooner than that. But uh, um, uh, no, planning a uh, planning a, a big announcement at the end of the year. Good, good. That'll. Uh, I'm very curious um, to see how it goes, but um, sometimes I get a little worried because people are ambitious, people have goals, people have timelines, and that's great. That's all part of a plan. But then I'm worried. I'm like, okay, I, I hope it's okay though if they get to wherever they, you know, a certain milestone, and they're not quite where they need to be. But with you, you've proven that uh, you're okay. It doesn't mean you're a failure if you get to a milestone and you're not quite where you are. You'll just push back things a little bit and, and keep that ax to the grindstone. And um, as yeah. Jess alluded to, uh, I'm, I'm more than confident that you'll get there. Maybe not as quick as you your, those timelines, but um, you, you'll get there and you're not going to rush anything and you'll just uh, let the no, numbers, no. let your returns dictate that. No, the finish is definitely, the, the exit is definitely going to occur. Um, and I'm not gonna base it upon a time but I can do math and project it out and go somewhere around there. Um, but if it doesn't reach there at the time I want, I'm fine. I like that. I'm not going to base it on a time, but I can do math. So it'll, and that's really, that's the fact of the matter is I'm sorry, math maybe isn't your strong suit and none of this is difficult math that Dave's talking about. But yeah, if you want to be able to do this sort of stuff, you kind of got to do, be able to do at least some math um, and, and be able to think things in a rational way. So uh, that's, a, that's a good way to end it is, but I can do math. So yeah, just make sure you, you can do math. But uh, Dave, thank you very much uh, for hanging out. All right, well, thank you very much, guys. And we'll see you in the chat room. Listeners though, before you go, a final few things. If you are listening on the YouTube channel, please realize that there's other stuff besides these podcast interviews. There's live trade videos, there's vlog videos, there's quick tip videos, stuff, from various different um, you know, kind of angles of the market. So check out those. Hopefully you decide to ultimately subscribe to the channel as a whole. If you're listening on iTunes or any of the other podcast players, uh, be sure to subscribe. And especially on iTunes, if you could leave us a rating, uh, we real appreciate that quite a bit. It really goes a long way. So uh, thanks in advance if you choose to do that. And then finally, if you're listening at claytrader.com on the show notes page, leave us a comment, click that share button. We will read comments, we will reply to them. We're all for being interactive uh, if people are willing to reach out to us. So that's uh, another very quick way to, to express suggestions, feedback, or you know whatever else uh, you may wanna leave in the comment section. So again, thank, to, thank you to all of you as listeners. Thank you to our esteemed co-host Chez and Dave for coming back. And we'll see you all back next week. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.